God is a good God. Hello, mm -hmm. folks. Once again, we are live. My name is Mohammed Faridi. I'm the host of Forsaking My Father's Religion. Folks, I just got back from a very important trip. You know about it. Uh, it's in the community post. And I also post about the Bible distribution we did in Middle East. We uh, handed out 6,000 of these books. Let me show you actually right here. These are the New Testaments in Farsi, pocket size. 6,000 of these we handed out to Persian, Iranian, uh, Muslim that they were in Middle East. And uh, we saw the salvation of 375. The biggest lie you will ever hear that Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. That is the biggest lie. We are seeing the mass exodus from Islam and Muslims all over the world. As you will hear Sarah's story, an Albanian Muslim who converted to Christianity. Muslim, Muslims from all over the world in our time are converting from Islam to Christianity. And I tell you, 375 salvations is a big deal. And every one of those lives that is going uh, to change, it is going to change a lot of other people's lives. Those Muslims who convert from Islam to Christianity will talk to their friends, families, and you will see this amazing waves of transformations into the Islamic world. But today I have my sister, an Albanian Muslim who lives in Canada, is going to share her fascinating story of walking out of the darkness of Islam to the kingdom and to the embrace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, make sure you subscribe. Make sure, if you haven't already, share this episode and let the people know that we are making a dent in the kingdom of darkness by bringing to you all of these testimonies of ex-Muslims. Please, uh, Sarah, thank you for accepting my invitation. Thank you for being here. Tell us who you are and what is your fascinating story. We can't wait to hear. Hello, brother. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, my name is, my real name is Servi, but I go by Sarah. I like Sarah better. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, born in Canada, but when I was three years old, my parents um, moved back to Europe, Macedonia. So my parents are Albanian. So I grew up in Macedonia. I went to Albanian school there. I was the eldest of five children. My parents had four daughters and uh, um, one son. Um Growing up as a child, um, there was certainly um, physical, emotional, and other abuses that I don't wish to go into in details at this point. But um, I always felt uh, unloved, unwanted. I was put down um, a lot for being a girl. I remember crying. There were times I would cry myself to sleep, and I would... Um, cry for hours, hide in the barn and cry and ask Allah, why did you make me a girl if I'm not wanted, if I'm not loved? Um, but then when I turned 16, I came back to Canada. My parents let me come back to Canada to, to work. Um, and I lived with my aunt when I came to Canada. They arranged my marriage uh, shortly after to an Albanian Muslim men who controlled my destiny pretty much for the next eight years. Um, and he seemed to, he, um, to use religion basically to get away with all the cheating, with all, you know, well, um, Muhammad permitted men to beat their women. Muhammad, per, uh, Muhammad had multiple wives. If I want, you're lucky you're just the one. I can marry more. Um, he would tell me this all the time. And I thought he was crazy because I personally did not, I'd never read the sources and I thought he was just making this stuff up. But he knew about the his religion of Islam apparently more than I did. All I knew about Islam was what I was told by family, what I was to taught by imams. I had never read the sources. I had never questioned. I just thought that Islam was the true religion, the best religion. We were um, taught Christianity was wrong. They believed in a man God and Muhammad came and corrected and we had the true religion. That's all I knew, I believed in. I was what I call a story Muslim. So I believed what I had heard about Islam 
Mm-hmm. And I did believe Allah was the true God, and I believed Muhammad was his messenger, and that's who I prayed to. And um, so, yeah, at 16, moved to Canada. I lived with my aunt. Did you and your family practice Islam? Like, meaning, did you guys do the prayers, fasting, uh, typical mm-hmm. Muslim prayers? Mm-hmm. You had a Quran that you recited and thought this is going to bring uh, barakah or blessing to your family or something like that. Did, no, this- back home. Back when my parents were more cultural Muslims, um, men went to the mosque, but women didn't go. Um, I don't remember my parents reading the the Quran or 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 my mom going to the mosque. I remember my my dad and my brother going to the mosque. Um, but but now actually my mom is and my brother are very devout Muslims. Um, and they live here in Canada now. So my brother practically lives at the mosque. He's very devout Muslim. Um, and so is my mom. And my dad has passed, actually. And um, so, yeah. Um, so and- after after your family moved to Canada, they act, uh, the, the, let's say call it West, they actually start being more Muslim. Yes, interesting. Amazing. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, um, yeah, they started being more religious. I think it started with my brother mm-hmm. and then um, my mom. But, um, so yeah, I came to Canada when I was 16. I had an arranged marriage to this man who controlled my life for eight years. Uh, it was okay for him to beat me, to cheat, to, you know, is it even legal so, to have uh, to get married at 16? And my parents had to sign me off kind of thing, but it was just the Islamic nikah for the for, until I turned 18 and then we mm-hmm. actually got legally married. Mm-hmm. So, wow. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um and then we I I left them actually at um when I saw it started affecting my daughters cuz I had two daughters with them in my teen marriage. Um, when I saw it started affecting my daughters, I actually walked away from that marriage. I left them and then I became very independent. I went back to school. I got my nursing degree. I, uh, uh, got a career in nursing, raised my daughters by myself. And then in my early thirties, um, I fell in love again. And this time I picked this man myself and but before, I, before we move on, Sarah, mm-hmm. because this is an important uh, point. Okay. So at 16, you married a Muslim, Albanian Muslim man. The Correct. marriage was completely arranged by your uh, parents. They signed you off to this man. How old was he? He was only three years older than me, wow. actually. Wow. And yeah. then this Muslim Albanian used Islam to control and manipulate you. Correct. And uh, he was doing you a favor being uh, 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 being just having one wife because Islam allowed him to have multiple wives, but he was uh, telling you he's a good man, he's, he's doing you a favor because he could have multiple wives, but no, he's just such a wonderful man that he's just having you. Correct. I should, you know, you should feel privileged, he used to say, because, wow. you know, I can easily go get three more wives. Yep. So... Yeah. Um, and then um, this, this, you, you were so, so privileged to be married to such an abusive person. And yes. then you went through. And then he did talk about Muta, actually. That's how he justified his cheating ways with other women. But I didn't even understand that. I didn't think that was a thing. I had never heard of, you know, of that, never read about that, that um, that was a thing in Islam, in the Islam religion. Mm-hmm. So, so I always defended the prophet um with him and with other people when i had heard something like that i just yeah. thought that th- that w- those were sir. those were rumors i thought right i could not imagine i you know someone who knew god would do these things imagine all of your life you have been told that this is the perfect man yes the example for humanity and morality exactly and now you're hearing that this guy was a polygamist. He had, 
He was a pedophile because he married a six a years child. old, consummated mm -hmm. in a nine. You're hearing this, but you cannot believe it. You say, no, I refuse be to believe it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I refuse to believe it. And like most Muslims, you know, because they put Muhammad on a pedestal, right? He was a perfect man. They say, I refuse to believe it. I made excuses for him. I, um, How out of ignorance, of course. How man have such a life? Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it even, you know, it's, and then you, you, you yourself start actually being in denial. This exactly. Be, and then uh, start to defend the actual abuser yes that's fascinating so mm -hmm. how long does you, how how long you've been uh, you you were married to this muslim man eight years and how, how was it did you have any love did you had any good times or it was no always... honestly no it was always chaos there was no love he was barely home he was just doing this thing he'd come home to eat and when he didn't like the meal he would throw the his plate on my face and and smash it wow. um yeah so i basically cooked and cleaned for him for eight years and raised his kids two, or our kids i should two, say two, two um, and then, my two um, girls yeah would you sarah as as a, as a person who was married to a muslim for eight years would you recommend marrying a muslim man to the audience whoever is watching this show or going to uh, hear this on any sort of podcast would you as a woman who married and experienced being married to a muslim man for ages would you recommend that to anybody absolutely not my heart literally breaks when i hear any non-muslim um person or a uh, christian um is dating a muslim man or wants to marry a muslim man because I know they have no idea what they're getting into. I know how Muslim men think now. Um, I have seen countless of Muslim men use and abuse um, not only Muslim women, but non-Muslim women, especially non-Muslim women. They, they use them and then they just drop them like they're nothing. Um, I have rarely like ever seen a Muslim man, um, unless you, you know, stay, marry a non-Muslim woman unless they convert to Islam and they basically surrender um, and become puppets of, of, of them. So and after I have close abuse, relatives, cl mm -hmm. close relatives, and I'm not going to name names who who dated um, non-Muslim women and um, just dropped them. One of them even um, um, took her life because she couldn't handle after being, you know, used for so long. Wow. And wow. Wow. folks, you're hearing it. Don't do it. Don't in entertain such things. Ladies, I know you were, you're thinking, oh, that Muslim man is charismatic and poetic and um, big and handsome, but don't do it. The Bible tells us not to do it. Don't be unequally yoked. Sarah was a Muslim, marrying a Muslim, went through such abuse. How much more could a Christian or could, could a non-Muslim go through abuse marrying a Muslim or dating a Muslim? You're hearing it. Don't do it. Don't entertain it. Run away from it. Protect yourself. Protect your uh, future. Don't do that. This is not something that uh, you can play with. This is a serious matters. Don't do it. Thank you, Sarah. Please continue because this is such an important point, such an important thing because uh, I had other ladies on this very show that they have gone through, some of them, 25, 30 years of abuse mm -hmm. marrying to a Muslim. And at the end, it was nothing but heartache. The first ruined time... Future, ruined mm -hmm. life. The first time I actually learned that Polyg polygamy was still a thing in Islam was after my divorce, after I got my career and I thought, you know, like I'm still young, maybe I should get married again. And I joined a Muslim dating website and I was flooded with what sh shocked me, men from the West, from the U.S., from Canada, asking um, if I want, if I was okay with being there 
a second, third, or fourth wife. And these were professors from the U.S. Um, I could not believe it. At first, I thought it was a joke until I got multiple messages. Well, I signed off that website for good, and I think it was all trash. (laughs) Yeah, I could not believe it. So that's when I actually started researching, and, and I didn't know that that was a thing. Because in my culture where we came from, men did not marry. I never knew of a man to marry um, a second wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. But so I, I, I had heard, mm-hmm. though, that mom had had more than one wife. But I was okay with that part because I was told that he was so perfect that he was able to treat them equally. And for a human being, it's impossible like for a normal human being, it's impossible to treat two women or three, four women equally. Yeah. I didn't really know exactly how many wives, but I knew that Muhammad had multiple wives, but I thought yeah, he, he had, was so he had perfect. 11. He, he had, had 11. 11. Now I know, he, yes. And, and he did it for the women. That's what yeah. I was told, the Muslim. He was such a good man. He would be marrying his wives and doing this because he, lo- he, was, he was being good to the woman. If he wouldn't marry those women, man, they didn't have any chance. He, he just need, they just needed a nine years old. He could have just could have adopted the child if she needed, uh, you no, know, no, but someone. He was or he for could, her <laughs> yeah, because Muhammad is the perfect. He had a woman's shelter. Mm-hmm. He should have ran a woman's shelter, you know, and exactly. if he really wanted to support them, <laughs> yeah, without consummating. Yeah. Without consummating, exactly. Wow, wow, what a what a story. So uh, after going through your marriage and being abused and used by this man, and um, what what you left, he left you with two kids, two, um, and then I happened? actually walked away from that marriage and left okay. him. He he didn't you, you he didn't want a divorce. Mm-hmm. He harassed me and abused me for another few years. Um, I can't count how many times I had to repair my windows because he would break the windows and break in when I was in home and destroy my stuff. And he would destroy my books because he heard, he knew I was going to school and he was just, so it, it took, he actually got arrested several times. Um, and finally he backed up and thankfully I lived in Canada. So I had some protection, um, and was able to break free from him. Okay. So um, uh, let's move on and um, um, see what happened afterward. So then, like I said, I became very independent. I got a career. I was in, you know, to the nice car, nice house. I was raising my daughters. I wanted to give my daughters everything that I didn't have when... um, when I was growing up and I did that, but deep down I still felt um, empty moment. Like there's something, like there was a hole in my heart and no matter what I did, I mean, I even got to martial arts, um, got a black belt, competed, um, got many gold trophies, that didn't do it. I got into fitness, um, you know, training. I was in top shape and I, all still identifying as a Muslim, Mm -hmm. although not practicing other than I did do the fasting. Um, I admit I didn't do the five prayers all all the time. Um, I still believed that there was, you know, there was God and uh, Allah was the true God. And um, in my I don't think actually a, a day went by in my life where I didn't acknowledge Allah and his prophet. Um, I would never go to sleep without praying to him or wake up without praying or, mm-hmm. you know, doing the rituals. Like I never entered my house without saying the Islamic rituals or even enter the bathroom and, you know, all these phrases and in a language I didn't understand, of course, and didn't know what I was saying most of the time. But I tried my best. You just repeated and, the chants. Yes, the chants I repeated exactly mm-hmm. like that I had heard and, and learned. Um, and then in my early 30s, I thought, you know, um, I have everything. I'm still not happy. I'm still sad. Um, 
I think the only thing that's missing in my life is love. And the only love I knew was romantic love. So I thought maybe I will start, um, you know, dating and see if I can find someone. Mm -hmm. Well, I met this um, guy who is now my son's father. I had a son with him and I fell madly in love because he was not controlling. I could still be myself, be independent. And um, I felt valued by him because he didn't question me. He didn't control me. He completely trusted me, constantly told me that I was an amazing woman and he had no reason um, to trust me. But at the same time, he was a very broken man and had many issues and um, I'm not going to talk too much about him because I don't have his permission to talk about him but um, and he is my son's father and I know my son will uh, listen to this video Um, my son is aware of some of his issues but not all of them yet he is still young he is only 12 Mm -hmm. Um, but I For several years, I made a career of trying to rehabilitate this man, and I wanted to be with him so bad, but that didn't work. That failed. And um, when I heard that he was dating another woman, I was broken, and I hit a low that I didn't know existed. Um, And I had had many lows in my life prior to that but this time it was painful um one of my biggest fears was to be a single mom and yet I had I was facing being a single mom because it was hard raising my girls although it wasn't as hard as being married to an abusive man raising two kids on my own it was was really hard and here I was um Faced with being a single mom again, my second marriage failed. Will what, what will my friends say? What will my family say? Um, I'm, you know, and the the voices in my head um, constantly um, played like a tape recorder. You're not loved. No one loves you. Your ex husband didn't love you. This guy didn't love you. Your parents didn't love you. And I just could not shut it off. It was painful. I remember feeling so much pain in my chest that I couldn't even sleep most nights on my bed. I would just cry myself to sleep on the floor because I felt like I was suffocating. Um, That's how much pressure, anxiety, and pain I was feeling in my chest. And it um, it was one of those nights, Muhammad, that I came face to face with the living Jesus. It was a night, typical night. I had cried myself to sleep and I had tried everything. I knew I needed help. I had tried um, self-help books. I had tried counseling. I had tried, and I mean when I say self-help books, like hundreds of books because I knew I wanted to heal. I knew I needed help, but I didn't know how to do it. I prayed to Hala didn't work. Counseling didn't work. Um, I tried everything. I even tried yoga. I was told by my doctor to try. Um, yes. Um, and even, even tried, I remember going to psychics during that time. And yes, I have repented by the way. Um, but out of desperations, I tried everything to, to, to help and heal. So the depressed doctor was telling the depressed patients what, what, he, he, what she needs to do to get better. The doctor himself needed help, but it was telling you <laughs> that if you do yoga, you're going to be fine, huh? <laughs> yes. Amazing. Yes. Amazing yeah, amazing, how the right? the ways of this world are. Yeah. Uh, let me tell you a quick uh, story about this. We have a neighbor that is a counselor, and um, um, one of the um, one of my friends, let me not, acquaintance, one of the... Uh, um, one of the other neighbors that we were acquainted uh, uh, in, in relationship with, she, he goes to, to her, the counselor, because of the PTSD and uh, being in the army and so on and so forth. And she, the counselor, which uses marijuana to soothe her pain, was telling the patients, if you start using marijuana, you'll be fine. Just imagine. 
Isn't that the perfect picture? When Jesus Same. said the blind will lead you to a hole, a blind cannot lead a blind. How I, could a I, counselor, a doctor that doesn't know God, doesn't know Jesus, can help another person? Like, so that's that, exactly that, what I tell that's people. It. That's, that's it. what I tell. That's what, that I tell. That's what I tell people. Very um, counsel, counsel from that lady to that neighbor. That very counsel it caused that neighbor more issues. It just the blind led the blind to another hole, a deeper hole, a darker hole. Because they don't know. If you don't know God, brothers and sisters, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you have no light in your life. Because Jesus, yes. the Son of God, is light. And if you don't have light, it yes. is utter darkness. Whatever you teach, whatever you counsel, whatever you tell people, it's going to be utter darkness. Amen. And that's what I tell people now, brother, that counselors have their own issues and so often bigger than yours. Uh, all they can give you is their opinion, you know. My, um, my friend's wife has master's degree in um, uh, psychology. And uh, she, was, she was trying to get her doctorate and PhD eventually to become a psychologist. She said, when I was in university, she's a believer. Mm -hmm. She said, when I was in university, these people that are studying psychology to become psychologists of our time, mm -hmm. they are the most depressed people I've ever met. She quit the university to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And somehow these people are going to teach, help us to do better. The only help, the only hope is Jesus Christ Amen. and accepting him as your Lord and Savior and telling and make him the make him making him the Lord of your life. That's the Amen. bottom line of it. If you Amen. want to get out of it, it, the answer, the door out of your misery is Jesus Christ. Nothing Amen. else. Amen, brother. I now I know that. I know that he is the only one that can fill that emptiness, that hole in your heart. Until then, we're just gonna keep seeking. We're gonna remain broken and keep searching. <clears throat> and he he is the only one. So um, yeah. what happened after you trying all the psychologists and their drugs and all of the yoga classes, which uh, God forbid, uh, another yeah. religious practice by the name of exercise, yoga. And then uh, you, you went to the psychics. Uh, did they read your palm? And so basically, you about the I uh -huh. dabbled, basically, I dabbled into what I know now. I didn't even have a name for it, uh, Mohammed. I just uh, now I know it's called the New Age. It's another cult. It's a cult. It's an occult that um, it's um, it's popular right now, unfortunately. Um, so I read all the 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 books from all these um, bas basically all the books that Oprah Winfrey recommends. Um, she's right into the occult heavily. Um, I read hundreds of the New Age books, but yet I didn't really have a name for it. I just read them for motivation. It's motivational. Um, uh, to I knew I needed help and the religion wasn't that I was in wasn't doing it so I was just trying to become a better person by reading these what they call positive books self-help books and um but but they it's it's an occult and it can destroy you so um and including yoga I mean um we're not going to get into that but yeah I've um, so I don't do yoga anymore. Um, so all of this you, you 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 did it didn't help. No, no. In fact, the more I tried, worse. the more I tried, the worse I felt. I remember going to yoga class and then coming home and feeling I felt good while I was at yoga, um, but I remember coming home and feeling empty. Or I tried salsa dancing. I remember I thought maybe I just need a new ho hobby. I just wanted to stay busy and. I also tried um, salsa, so I love dancing, and I would go a couple hours a week, just wow. go dance away, dance my, try to dance my depression away, and then I would come home, I would still cry, I would still be lonely, I would still be empty, I would be sad, and I mean really sad, and I was embarrassed to even discuss this with friends and family, because everyone knew me as the independent and strong woman, and I just kept this all to it myself, looked, and yeah, it looked on the outside. On the pretty, outside, everything but from the looked inside perfect. Was rotten. Correct. Just like yes. Islam. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So I thought um, I I will, you know. So I got in, yeah, in, in this relationship, and then that then then helped. That got me dragged me down even further, and it was yeah one of those nights um, while I'm grieving on top of everything, grieving over this man that I loved dearly and had a child with, and um, gave him the most beautiful son, and he still couldn't, um, you know, couldn't change his ways and. Um, be a responsible man that my son deserved. So, um, but then I was somewhat okay. I knew it was for the best for my son and I, um, parting from him until I heard that he was dating another woman. And that's when I really hit a low. And it had been about seven months that every night I would cry myself to sleep. And the only way I could fall asleep is when I exhausted myself crying. I, I couldn't eat properly. I think I was under, 100 pounds I started getting weak and it was one of those nights that I came face to face with the living Jesus and um and this it started in a dream brother um although it was more real than anything I had ever experienced in my life um more real than talking to you here right now what happened that night um, yep, tell us, tell us about it. And, uh, we're here to see what, what was this, in this encounter like. Yeah. In this dream, brother, it started, I was hearing, um, terrifying voices, like terror, like people were being murdered. And it was like many voices, like nothing I had ever heard before. And I was concerned of these people. So immediately I started trying to find where these voices were coming from. And I started walking along this hallway and I remember seeing many doors, but they were all closed. And then I made my way onto this balcony, trying to follow these um, terrifying voices. And I looked over this balcony, glass balcony, and I observed this dark, dark pit. It was just the pit, black and white, and the only color I could see was this ugly creature with multiple, like, dragon-like creature torturing these people. And these people screamed in terror, and they were just running in circles. It seemed like there was only one gate in this pit, and they were being forced to go through that gate, and they didn't want to go. And the, only, the first thing that came to my mind was, I wonder if that's hell and these people are being forced to go into hell. And maybe they are men that have hurt women and children. And it appeared to me from where I was, but it was too deep down to tell for certain. But it appeared like it was men that I was observing. And no sooner that thought crossed my mind, I looked to my right. And there was a figure, a beautiful figure that I thought was Jesus. And I don't know why I thought that. It's not like I had met Jesus before. And then suddenly this ugly scene that I had just observed for a split second shut down. Not only I could not hear it anymore, I could not see it. I could not remember it. I was completely focused on this platform where I was, um, this beautiful figure um, and I thought it was Jesus, and he knew my thoughts. I didn't have to speak. I just thought, I want. he looks like Jesus. He said, I am Jesus. Those were his exact words. And my second thought was, he must be lying. How can he be Jesus? I knew I wasn't dead. And he answered that thought too. He said, would you like me to hug you? And then you will know it is I. And he was, he had this complete peace about him. So I had no reason not to trust him. I completely trusted him and I agreed to allow him to hug me. And when he did, brother, when he did, he put the, he wrapped his arms around me and 
it was like my entire body was filled with pure love. Love that I have no words to describe because that love does not exist. No human can give you that love. We cannot give that love no matter how hard we try. I try to describe it like your own child. You love them so much. Sometimes, I mean, especially when they're in their best behavior, you look at them and you just feel this love for them in your chest, you know, in your heart. But it was all over my body. Even my fingernails felt love. And all, all I could do was beg him. I was to to not let me go, to not take ever take what he just because I realized at that moment that he was everything I had wanted and more. Everything I had been searching, he just gave me. And I didn't care about anything else. I didn't care if I had arms. I didn't care if I had legs. Take it all. Just don't take him from me. Don't take what he just gave me, this bliss that he filled me with. And I begged him. And I, when I felt him loose in his grip, I screamed because I was terrified of parting from him. And when I screamed, I woke my little boy up who was sleeping beside me. He was only three years old at the time. And everything went back to normal, back to this world. And I found myself sitting in bed wondering what in the world that just happened and how is that possible? I could not understand it. I didn't know why it happened, how it happened. I just knew it did. And it was real. And I was healed of depression. I just felt peace and joy. And I didn't know how. Everything I had tried, nothing had helped. And so although I was healed, that was still the beginning of my confusion. And I didn't tell anybody. I didn't even know where to begin. So I kept that. I called it my Jesus secret. For two years, I didn't tell anybody. And that happened in 2015. Then in 2017, I ended up going on vacation to Costa Rica. And I was in that rainforest and I got sick. I had fever. And I remember laying in bed shaking. My whole body was, um, I was by myself. My whole body was um, trembling. And there was a cross over my bed. It was the first time I had been there for a few days, but it was the first time I really noticed that cross and I was laying on my back. I still had not read the Bible. You think, you know, I was slow. <laughs> you think you'd have this incredible experience with Jesus. The first thing you do is read the Bible. But as you know, we're taught the Bible's corrupt. Why would I want to read a corrupt book? I had read, you know, hundreds of other books and that had never occurred to me to read the Bible. But I always, you know, so anyways, I'm in this, um, in this room by myself in the rainforest in Costa Rica. And I'm staring at this cross as my body aching and wondering, what is it all about? I wonder what's it all about. Like, I, you know, and it did remind me of Jesus, but I didn't know the works of the cross. I was taught, you know, as you know, we're taught Jesus never died. And it was at that moment, there was a knock at the door. Come in, I said. And it was a lady that I had only talked a couple times with in the cafeteria. And I didn't know she was a Christian, but she knew I was a Muslim because I had said no to pork. So she comes, she apologizes. It was really late at night. It was 11 p.m. But she says, and I was also cold. It was really chilly night, by the way. And because I wasn't feeling good, I have fever and my body's aching. And I remember thinking, I wish I brought a heat, heating blanket, you know, because I had one at home. I thought I didn't know it was going to be chilly here. This lady knocks and she says, I'm so sorry to come so late, but I'm leaving tomorrow and I just want to say bye. And I wanted to bless you for some with some stuff that I have been using while I've been here and enjoyed. And it was a bunch of snacks and it was a heat blanket. 
<laughs> like heating blanket. I couldn't believe it. And I said, that is interesting because I just wished I had one. Um, because I'm not feeling good. I'm, I'm start, I'm, I'm, I think I'm sick. Um, I have fever and, uh, my body's aching. And she asked if she could pray for me. And of course I said, sure. She prayed for me and it was the first time in my life I had seen, heard someone pray in Jesus name and hold, she was holding my hand. And I kid you not, before she even let go of my hand, my fever left my body. I started sweating. The aches left my body. And it scared me. I pulled my hand from her and I said, um, how did you do that? I said, how did you? You don't understand. I didn't take anything for my fever. I didn't have anything. Um, and as a nurse, I knew that you know, once fever starts, it has to, it runs its course and it doesn't just stop like that. And it was, that was the first evening I had spiked fever. And she just smiled and she said, oh honey, it's not me. It's, it's, it's Jesus. He loves you so much. And I literally went, oh, Jesus loves me. It was the first time a human had told me that Jesus loved me, but I had experienced his love. So I, shared my experience with her that day for the first time and she just smiled and um um as if she understood you know and she helped me download um a bible on my phone a bible the bible app on my phone and she suggested i should um listen to the bible and learn more about jesus and um so i came home and then we parted ways with her um that night and i didn't see her again um, although we became a Facebook friends, so, um, we would just, you know, message happy new year kind of thing. Once a year, she'd send me Merry Christmas, um, on Facebook and, um, and I came home even more hungry to know more about this Jesus that had showed me this love, this and healed me twice now. Um, and I wanted a way to return that love somehow. Um, so I did. I came, after I came back, I actually, so I thought, I talked to my brother. I started, I shared my experience with my brother. So he convinced me that I should start being more religious. And he told me that, oh yeah, you know, we believe in Jesus. He was a great prophet. There's a whole chapter in the Quran about him. Um, and yeah, you should be more religious. And that was like, you know, so I thought maybe I should, you know, maybe this is how I will learn more about him. So I went back to the only religion I knew um, and almost kind of forgot about this Bible app that the lady who prayed for me downloaded. So I started getting into Islam. I thought I'm going to learn Islam. I'm going to be more religious. I started going to the mosque. I would listen to imams all day long. Um, um, and But I started feeling sad again. And the Jesus I had experienced, I could not find in Islam. In fact, it was making breaking my heart that it was all about Muhammad. Like, how can they say they believe in Jesus? I don't hear them talk about Jesus when I go to the mosque, right? They don't talk about Jesus other than if you talk about Christianity. Then they, oh, they love Jesus and they they believe in Jesus. And um, But other than that, you don't usually hear Muslims talk about Jesus. So I started feeling sad again. So I thought, and I came to the, while reading the Quran, I came to um, the verses that talk about Je how Jesus was not crucified. And at first I thought, because I had watched, by the way, during that time period, um, 
after I came back from Costa Rica, I had watched The Passion of Christ. Um, a friend sent it to me, and I had watched that, and I wept for for two weeks, I would say. I just, I was a mess. I could not understand how this perfect being would be, would be killed, and I could not understand it from my Muslim mentality. So when I read in the Quran at first that he wasn't crucified, I thought, oof, you know, that made me feel better almost. But then you go on and read and it, you know, that it just appeared. And then you start looking about that and you start questioning. And I started asking, um, you know, and the best explanation they have is that uh, Allah replaced Jesus was somebody else, and somebody else was um, died, and and Allah just deceived all these people watching. And as you know, one 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 way Allah identifies Himself is as is a great deceiver. Um, and we know they tried to change that to planner now, but it doesn't help. Doesn't you know? Doesn't help any um, because He still you know deceived all these people that were watching. So that weighed heavy on my heart. I thought, how can then, who is responsible for Christianity if, if the creator, their creator deceived them and make it, made it look like Jesus died, but he didn't die? Um, that's horrible. Like that, like the creator, our creator can't, you know, I don't think he would do that. So I started questioning that. And Anyway, so after reading that chapter, I couldn't even make myself read the Quran anymore. Like I was stuck there. Like, how can this happen? You know? And then how can you blame Christians for believing that Jesus died if their own creator, like, uh, deceived them? So that's when I started um, watching. I thought, you know, I should see maybe what Christianity says about Jesus. And that's when I started um, watching um, some Christian, some video, Christian videos, um, I started Googling. And it was actually only about, I made, I remember I made it my New Year's resolution that, uh, that year in 2019. I thought my New Year's resolution would be to really learn and find out who Jesus is. You know, every other year I'd been, you know, how to get better, how to be, uh, get more fit, how to make more money, you know. And that year I made a New Year's resolution that I will find out who Jesus really is. Like, I was like so hungry, so desperate. I wanted to know. So I started watching um, Christian um, and Muslim debates. Um, I started watching some Christian videos. And in these debates, I would notice a pattern. And they would just quote the Bible, but not much the Quran. They were obsessed with quoting the Bible. So I would go check what the Bible said. And it was, they weren't right, you know. Um, I would find they would lie all the time. And then I started um, looking up. Zachary Nikes uh, that I was watching for I, about two years, probably almost every day, his claims, and that's not you know. So I found, I found he wasn't really honest with the text, what the Bible said, um, and I found Christian apologists to be more honest. This is what we believe, and this is why. So what they said aligned better with when I went to do my research, right? And then I started doing the same thing with the Quran, like all these th these claims that I had believed and that I had heard and believed um, that made me feel proud to be a Muslim. And that, that was like the scientific miracles and the conception theory. I remember reading that and just holding my head like, what in the world? Not only it's wrong, but makes absolute no sense. Um, and... Um, and I had believed that, and I had told people about that, that, hey, Mohammed knew exactly how that, you know, um, about the, 
conception and how the baby grows and all this stuff, all the stages. And, oh, I was so embarrassed. I was like, I need to find all those people to tell them that I was wrong. <laughs> you know, so I couldn't believe it. Like one by one, I would, you know, look these things up and they were far from the truth. And by June, beginning of June of 2019, um, I was watching a video from Seven Under Club, and it was actually a woman. I don't remember her name or exactly what her story was, but she she had left Islam and um, became a Christian and was being persecuted. And I remember she had lost one eye, and I remember listening you you know at the end of the video. Um, The host said, um, if you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And didn't really know still exactly what that means to be saved. But I remember being convicted and, and I thought, what do I have to lose? I already believe Jesus with all my heart. I love him with all my heart. Um, what do I have to lose if I confess with my lips? Um, I've already tried every other thing, you know, um, even stupid things like, what do I have to lose? So I repeated after him and I said the prayer and I said it with, now we know it's, you know, Romans, um, he was quoting. So I repeated after him and I said it with all my heart and I meant it. And I didn't know if I need to turn certain direction, if I need to stand, if I need to bow, he didn't explain that. He just said, repeat after me. So I said it in different positions, <laughs> looking up, uh, bowing, you know, um, even I even looked out the window and recited uh, what he said. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, you know, he knew I was serious. And nothing unusual happened that day, but I felt at peace. I thought, finally, I made a decision. But now what? Now what do I do? And I made a decision not to tell anyone. I thought my my faith is between me and my creator. I'm not going to tell anything. My Muslim family will never understand. Um, so I'm not going to say anything. I'll just keep it to myself. But something happened. I could not shut up after that. I could not just not say anything. I thought, how selfish would it be of me to know Um, this incredible Jesus and to know that he is more than a prophet because by then I was convinced that he was more than a prophet Um, and not tell people like and I started by sorry I'm thirsty there I started by telling my devout Muslim brother And before I even finished saying everything I wanted to, he pointed his finger on my face and he said, don't ever call Jesus Lord because you will go to hell. And although I knew what Islam says about apostasy, right? And I I, I knew I had read that in the Quran and I knew, but hearing my only brother say that and and then the enemy was telling me like, he will disown you and, 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 and I love my brother so much more than my own life. Um, I I felt sad. I came home that day and he's always started challenging me about the Trinity. And of course, I could not defend the Trinity. I didn't know anything about the Trinity yet. All I knew is that Jesus was real and he needed to know. Um, and I couldn't defend the Trinity. So we stopped the conversation there and I came home that day. Um, evening I remember and I did the only thing I knew how and I got on my face and it was the first time in my life probably that I had poured my uh, my heart out to my creator and had and not just said chance you know but I spoke from the deepest part of my heart and I said I don't care what you want to be called I don't care if you want to be called Allah, God, Jesus, whatever you want to be called. I don't care what religion I have to follow. I just want to know the truth. Those were my words. I just want to know the truth. 
I want to know who Jesus is. And I know you didn't give me that experience to confuse me. I don't want to live confused. I, I, I know you're able to tell me the truth. I don't know how you're going to do it. That's your job, basically, I told God. Um, I just want to know the truth. And I also watched the video that night before I went to sleep after that prayer. I just wanted to watch something, something about Christianity. So I just typed Christian videos. The first one that popped up was a pastor. He's a street pastor here in Toronto, Pastor Lynn. And he, um, Pastor David Lynn. And basically in that video, he was being arrested back in 2019. And I felt so sad. I actually shed tears. I thought, God, like, what is this world coming to? We have like gay parades, people roaming around naked with body paint, with paint on their bodies and, and destroying things and, and being obnoxious and nobody arrests them. But a man is arrested for telling people that you love them because that what those were his words just before he got arrested telling by you know bystanders that god loves you and i felt so sad and after that i finished watching that video i remembered my bible app and i put put on the psalms and i fell asleep i think i fell asleep like really fast which was on you you know kind of unusual for me but i fell asleep i was so tired i fell asleep and it was that night I woke up to the most clear, the most incredible voice that not only my ears heard, Mohammed, but my entire being heard this voice. And the voice was asking me if I wanted Jesus to live in me. And I still didn't understand what that meant, how... I didn't know about the Holy Spirit, that, that Christianity teaches the Holy Spirit can, lives in you um, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So the voice said, do you truly want Jesus to live in you? And the first thing that came out of my ignorant lips was only if he's God. And I opened my eyes and I looked. And their steward, um, angelic being beside my bed, dressed in white. And just next to him stood the same figure of Jesus that I had um, seen in my dream in 2015. And immediately I recognized him and I shouted again, are you God? And he didn't. As soon as that word left my mouth, he didn't answer me verbally. I observed the most incredible light coming from above. And as this light was approaching me, it was not nothing like I had ever seen before. It was peace. It was bright. It was pure truth. I suddenly went from doubting, questioning, to knowing, to knowing with my entire being what was in front of me was the living God. And I just tilted my head to the side because I could not even look at this holy light. And I was just repenting over and over. I am so sorry I doubted you. I am so sorry I didn't believe you. You are God. You are God. You are God. And as I'm saying this over and over, I was asked the same question for the third time. And I knew I had to say yes. And I wanted to say yes, but there was that one more moment. And now I didn't, I knew who Jesus was. But I had a moment of, I was doubting myself and I didn't understand that for until just several months ago, I was watching one of uh, Sam Shimon's videos, uh, Brother Sam, and he was just praying and pouring his heart out to the Lord, as he usually does. And he was saying, you know, Lord, it's not you I don't trust. You are perfect. Um, it's me I don't trust. It's this flesh I don't trust, you know. And 
I remember it took me right back to my encounter having that moment where I trusted him completely. I knew who he was, but I didn't trust myself. And I remember thinking, what if I say yes, and then I still somehow fail him and and can't and, and, and deny him again? And I was so scared of that because I didn't want to do that because I knew that would break his heart. And he knew he knew my thoughts and he just stood there and then finally I felt complete peace and I just said yes 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 three times and for a long time I didn't know why I said yes three I still not sure why I said yes three times but I wanted to make sure he knew I was serious and I said three times I said yes I was asked the question three times if I wanted Jesus to truly live in me and when I repeated back I said yes 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 soon as the last yes left my lips I called it for for a few years. I called it the electrifying feeling happened. I didn't have the biblical language to explain what occurred, but the power of God came on me, Muhammad, and it was beautiful. It was incredible. I remember laying there. I couldn't understand it, and I couldn't didn't know how that could happen. But I just knew it was of God, and I don't know if I could not move or I didn't want to move because I didn't want to interrupt the process because I knew at that moment that my life was going to change. And I knew what was happening was of God. So I laid there. I don't know again in real time how long it took. It felt like it was between five to seven minutes, but I don't know. I can't tell you how long that happened. I just remember laying there and it was like warm, um, electricity waves going through my body from head to toe it felt like surgery was being performed and I was being purged and but it it didn't hurt it was comforting it was peaceful and suddenly this you know subsided and I stood up and even when I was laying there I knew exactly where I was and I sat up, it was 5 a.m., looking around what happened. And I ran to my window, my bedroom window, hoping to see another glimpse of that perfect light I had seen. But there was, everything was back to normal. And I started looking out other windows, walking, pacing back and forth in my house. And I went to the back of the house and looking out the window, wondering how in the world did that happen? And I am weeping, weeping tears of joy. Like I just could not believe that my creator cared enough to answer me in such a way where I will never again have doubt him. Um, that he had answered my prayers. He, he had made himself so real to me that he cared that much to 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 do this for me so i'm looking out the window and everything's back to normal but it was like i was looking from a new set of eyes i remember looking my house is built on the hill and then you can see there's a plaza behind it and you can see all the lights and it was still early in the morning and i remember thinking looking out and everything looked that much more magnified the trees looked more beautiful the lights looked more beautiful you know and I felt so light like so much junk had come off of me I literally felt like I could fly it was incredible um but I was one thing I was afraid of I didn't know how long I was going to be able to remember what had just occurred like i I thought it might just get erased and I won't remember and I never wanted to forget. So I'm thinking, what should I do? Like, should I start writing things down? Um, I grabbed my phone trying to uh, record something, but my phone was uh, dead. So I found the nearest outlet. I plugged it and the, the only thing I could think of is um, take a picture of my messy crying face. 
Um, and I thought if I see that picture, maybe it's, I'm going to be able to, um, remember what happened in case I forget, but I never forgot. Every time I think about what happened, it, I feel like it just happened. Every little detail is engraved in my heart and my brain. Um, so... So that was, I even remember the date, never wrote the date down. I remember the date. It was June 25th, the morning of June 25th, 2019, that that, the second experience occurred. So I had no more doubts um, who Jesus was. I knew with all my heart that I had made the right decision two weeks prior and giving my life to him. And now I wanted to learn how I can worship him. How can I worship the God of the Bible? What do I do? What church do I go to? I had never been to church. No one had talked to me about Jesus before. And I could not believe, I remember pacing that morning back and forth in my house and asking myself, like, where are all the Christians that know this incredible God? And why aren't they out there shouting rooftop, telling everyone about him? Like, why has nobody... Um, I thought I lived in a Christian country. Nobody told me about this incredible God that, um, that, you know, so, and then I'm thinking like, what church do I go to? So I start researching, you know, Christian churches and then so many churches come, come up and then I, I learn about different denominations and I'm thinking like, how do I know which one to go to? And, um, and where, you know, I need to get a Bible, which Bible, you know, where do I get a Bible, I'm thinking, and all these thoughts and what church I go to. So I remember my, the only uh, person that had talked to me about Jesus um, two years prior, Christine. So I messaged her on Facebook and I asked her, hey, you know, how are you doing? It's been a while since we chatted. Um, I think I'm a Christian now. <laughs> and... Um, I'm wondering, I want to go to church, but I don't know which church to go to. These are all the churches in my area. I was hoping she'd help me pick a church. And I send her a few links. And um, that wasn't that morning, actually. That was two weeks after that encounter that I did that. So for two weeks, I'm thinking, you know, and praying, what church should I go to? What should I do? How should I pray? I don't know. I've heard to live a life of Christ, but I don't know what that looks like, you know? So, um, so that's when I woke up then. Oh, and then one Sunday morning, I woke up from a dream again. That's when I messaged Christine. I woke up from this dream. And in this dream, I, I had a dream where she gave me two books. One was said Holy Bible and a leather casing. And the other book said when Jesus comes. Or no, when Jesus shows up. When Jesus shows up. So I clearly remembered seeing those titles. And I grabbed, in one hand, I grabbed the Bible she handed me. And then I grabbed the book and she said, here, this is your book. And as I'm thinking, you know, what do you mean this is my book? Like, and I read the title, like, I didn't know what she meant, like, is the book I wrote. I remember thinking, I didn't write this book. And, but I read the title when Jesus shows up. And immediately I woke up from that dream. But when I woke up, um, I call it the electricity feeling was on me. It was the power of God was on me. And I just laid there and I thought it wasn't as intense as it had been that night. Um, that set, um, morning of the 25th. But it was just these warm um, waves going up and down my body. And I just laid there. And then I stood up and I thought to myself, wow, that dream felt so real as if Christine was right here in my room. So and then I thought, I need, that's when I thought I need to go to church. Like what's happening to me is not a coincidence. Like I need to go to church. Maybe they have some, you know, ex they can explain how this is possible, how, you know, what, you know, what happened to me. So I thought, but what church do I go to? So that's when I messaged Christine, I remembered, and I messaged her and, uh, on Messenger on Facebook. And 
I just basically briefly said, hey, how are you doing? Long time, no talk. I think I'm a Christian now and I want to go to church, but I don't know what church to go to. So I copied some, I, I Googled the real Christian churches and several links came up in my area. So I sent them to her hoping she'd help me pick a church. But she lives in Seattle, so she didn't reply right away. So for about an hour, I kept checking and checking and she didn't reply. And then I thought, you know, I need to get to church. Like I could not. I could not sit down. I was just pacing that morning. I just n- knew I needed to go to church. So I just hop in my car. I start driving around. I was like, I'll just go to any church. I start driving around. I pass one church, two, three. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going and what the difference is. I'm just going to go to this one. So I go in. It, ha- it turned out to be non-denominational church, and they greeted me. They were so friendly, and I, um, I, I was early. Um, so they told me, um, and the, the message that day was, uh, about the cross and they had communion and they talked about communion and, um, and I just, I just felt like God was talking to me. Like here I am hearing this message for first time, but I understood it in my spirit and my heart. I just understood with this pastor and I'm just happy. I'm, 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 I can't stop crying. I'm just weeping. And it's not sadness. It's tears of joy. But at the same time, I'm a little embarrassed because I'm like looking around. I'm like, nobody else is crying. Like, what's wrong with me? You know, so I look back to try and thought maybe I'll go to the bathroom until I can like calm down. But they, they set me at the front and I thought more people will see me if I leave. So I just sat there, you know, and then the service was over. So I, went to my car and the first thing I did was grab my phone and see if Christina replied. And the first thing she said was, oh my goodness, Servi, God is so good. Do you realize that those are the books I have mailed to you? And I'm thinking, you have what? Like, what do you mean? How did you know I needed a Bible? And how did you, like, what do you mean, like, book? And then she sends me a snapshot where she had purchased the book on Amazon called when Jesus shows up. I didn't know that book existed. I didn't know what the book was about. I had never talked to her about that book. She just felt she needed to send me that, she said. And when she sent me the Bible, she decided to send me that. So I got that book within a week or so. And guess what the book was about, basically. Then talk about different denominations that The book was basically about a man's journey from a corporate world to living a Christ life up to retirement and beyond. And it gave me a snapshot of what it's like to live a Christ life. Um, And it was exactly what I prayed for. That's how good our God is. That's how incredible he is. Um, and that's not just the only example, like so many after that, I I would just have a question and it would be answered about the Holy Spirit. I remember praying, Lord, this Holy Spirit, I know you're real, but this Holy Spirit thing, I don't understand. I don't understand. So please like help me understand. I go, I decide to go to a different church that morning just to check it out by thought, you know, so I'm led to this church and that was even closer to my place. I walk in and guess what I see they had at my church that I was attending regularly. They didn't have this library of books where you could just sign books out and take them home uh, for free. So the first book that I saw was about the Holy Spirit. So I read that book and the as soon as I read the last page, I, you know, I was again under the power of God speaking and tongues and everything. I remember I prayed for three, uh, at least three hours in the spirit that day. Um, and I understood the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and yeah, so that's when I understood the comforter that the Bible was talking about that Muslims tell us that that's about Muhammad. And I'm thinking they don't know. They don't know what they don't know. They have no idea what they're talking about. They don't know the God of the Bible. They don't know the Holy Spirit. They don't know. They just know religion. They know religion. That's all That's all Muslims know. They don't know God. 
So those were the main events, basically, that um, then, yeah, so I remember another time, like, how I, 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 re- I, I noticed that th- this, this God I have discovered answers prayers, you know, um, and I can talk to him, I can ask him, I can pour my heart out, I can talk to him like I'm talking to my friend, I trust him, you know, and answers prayers. I remember the first healing prayer that he answered was um, I had to go to work at 3 p.m. one day and I picked up my son from school and his dad was supposed to pick him up but he didn't show up and because I had so many lates with my son being a single mom at work um, I was in a bit of a pickle at work you know they were giving me a hard time and I was like I don't want to lose my job Lord like what do I do I had no one to watch my son and he, he, he was sick when I picked him up from school. He was hot. He said his tummy was hurting. He wasn't feeling good. So I just laid him on the couch. And I remember my Bible had just arrived. It was still in a plastic casing. I didn't even know how to pray in a Christian, you know, the way Christians pray or anything. I just remember I put my one hand on my son. I put one hand on the Bible. And I said, Lord God, please uh, watch my son until I go to work and report and and ask them to find somebody to replace me. And then I would come back to him until I get back. Please watch him. And I think by now he was six years old. So I let my son on the couch. He drifted off to sleep and I went to work. I My workplace is close, six, uh, seven minutes from my house. So I went to work and um, I told my son to call me in a little bit at work and I'll let him know when he's going to come. So I'm call, you know, I'm, I'm keep looking at my phone. I'm at work. I'm all anxious. I've told them that my son's not feeling good. I need to go home and I'm waiting for another nurse to come on shift. And, um, so I can leave and my son's not answering. So I'm starting to panic a little bit, you know, I'm wondering what he's doing. And then suddenly almost an hour went by and my son calls me finally and he says mommy mommy you don't need to come home anymore if you don't want to I'm all better look I can jump up and down and I had to carry him from school because he was telling me his legs hurt he couldn't walk um, and his tummy hurts and he had high fever and I didn't give him anything for fever before I left either so um he's telling me he's all better that's when I just looked up and I said thank you Lord thank you Lord thank you nothing he you know he was well after that and I can give many examples you know how God answered prayers like that and then God started teaching me about warfare too after I remember having all these dreams about um about warfare that I couldn't really understand until I talked to one of my Christian friends and I said, I'm having like, they're so real. Like I just like, I would see um, in the spirit realm, like the, the, the dark side uh, attacking. And then I just, I would, the Holy spirit would say, you know, just call on the name of Jesus and nothing can arm you. And I would just call on the name of Jesus. I would plead the blood of Jesus and I remember there was one time just before um, COVID, I saw this. It was like dark, dark army coming. And they looked like black and white minions, you know, and there was like so many. It was like a field full of them. And I started, as soon as I started panicking and uh, clearly heard the Holy Spirit say, don't, don't fear not. Just lift up your hand and call on the name of Jesus. And I did that. And they stopped as if there was a line, Muhammad, that they cannot cross. And they stopped. And then the voice said, plead the blood of Jesus. You're protected by the blood. And remember, I still didn't know, you know, what that meant. I had not finished reading the Bible yet. And I would, I plead the blood of Jesus. They would turn, they turned around and they left at the speed of light. And I stood there amazed. I remember I just threw one little rock and they all turned around and left. And the Holy Spirit was teaching me basically the power of prayer. So 
Um, and then there's many other examples. I would see a storm, you know, a dark storm one time, and that was wiping everything in its way. Trees uprooted, cars flipping, and I started to panic. Again, the Holy Spirit would say, I would hear the voice crystal clear. Fear not where Jesus is, the storm cannot touch. And I would, I remember I stood by the window and watched the storm pass by. And I was unaffected, untouched by it. And after the storm was come, I went out and there were so many casualties and I was trying to help them and nobody was coming for them. And it's just, just these incredible, like, visions I would have that I had never ever even imagined well I was in the religion of Islam like um so it was like I I, I remember in saying Islam, there's so much darkness but there's no answer to it no answer um, to it exactly I, I'm um you know I come from a Muslim background just just as you are and uh, I remember for example whenever um, Muslim family members relative friends they had these demonic, dark sleeps or dreams or visions. So you couldn't do anything with it. It is so yes. common. It's, it's interesting. You're entrapped by it. Yes. It's interesting you mentioned that because in my younger days, I used to have those experiences often. Mm -hmm. um, I would just feel an entity, a darkness, suffocate me, choke me, mm -hmm. and... Um, and you couldn't do anything and about nothing, it. nothing. You, you, you it would just literally it. molest you and, and, and torture you. And you just laid there. There was nothing you can do. So anytime now I find it like every time, you know, I think like the living God cannot amaze me more. I get more amazed because nothing stands against his name. Nothing. No darkness. Every knee. Every, every knee, knee will bow, shall bow yes. down. Amen. There is Remember? no other name yeah. given unto I've, man that you yes. shall be saved. There is no. It's yes. the name of Jesus, and every, yes. knee will be, uh, every knee will bow. When I read that verse for the first or involuntarily, will bow. The thing is that um, to go back to that point of uh, those dark dreams that we had as Muslims, which is very common in the Islamic world or any other wor worlds, that uh, because um, you live in the kingdom of darkness. Mm -hmm. If you're a non-Christian, you're in the kingdom of darkness. If you are nothing but 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 a Christian, you will be dealing with these things because you're under a curse. You're open to all sorts of sorcery, witchcraft, demonic powers in your life. And then when um, when you convert to Christianity, it still follows you. Yes. But then, mm -hmm. at, in in when uh, the more you know about the Bible and the authority of a believer. The more you know about the blood of Jesus, the more you know that you have been redeemed mm -hmm. eternally. The book of Hebrews says we have been redeemed eternally once for all, meaning it is a one-time deal. You be, the more you understand these principles, of course, your, your spirit man has been made unto God, uh, recreated, regenerated, pure as the Holy Spirit is, but you don't notice in your head yet. You still have those... Uh, worldly islamic whatever mentality that it doesn't align with the bible but yes. as much as you become the disciple of christ as much as you're you understand what god has done for you the finished work of the cross the more you know all of this and you learn that these dark powers have no authorities over you they Amen. have no rights in your life you or your family then this, when you start pushing back and you declare the name of Jesus, you realize, my goodness, I have so much authority and power. Yes, so incredible. And these, these dark um, uh, curses or this um, demonic power, you break it off of your lives. Amen. And they let, let go. They have to. They have they to. They can't stay. They have and then to. You yeah. get the best of sleep ever. Yes. You live in peace. I don't have trouble sleeping anymore. <laughs> I sleep too much sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it is just the, this is that, the truth that verse you mentioned truth. every knee uh, must bow every tongue must confess jesus is lord i remember first time i read that i wept tears of joy because i remember remember that's what i did I, not knowing it was in the bible when i was in his presence 
all I could do was repeat, you are God, you are God, you cannot deny it, you just know that you know that you know who he is, and you can't deny it, you can't. Absolutely. Folks, yeah. you heard it. You are hearing it. Another powerful testimony of a Muslim who was absolutely miserable, abused by the world and marriages and failed in every different directions, every different aspects of life. You just name it. That is the, he, that, he. Is, that is the ways of the world. Failure, betrayal, rejection, curses weird things but god is so good god is so awesome jesus is so awesome that he paid the amazing price to redeem us and reconcile us to god what better gift than this if you hear it just another muslim was rescued out of the kingdom of darkness transferred translated to the kingdom of beloved son of god which God in amazing power and might and love embraces us. It's just amazing. And uh, I just want to mention to our believers that are watching from all over the world, you're, you're here, you're writing it to me from South Africa, New Zealand, Canada, everywhere in the world, Seattle, you're watching this program. Just, just the power of one prayer, somebody like Christina that comes and offers prayer to a Muslim, you can make the whole difference in the world. Yes, sometimes I wonder, brother, had she not prayed for me that night, had she not told me about the love of Jesus that day, would I have ever done anything? Would I have, um, you know, found him, you know, truly found him? I always wondered about that because it was, it was after that that I became even more hungry. Um, because what she did that confirmed my first encounter I had with him. Absolutely, the power yeah. of prayer. Um, yeah. we, we pray for people all over the world, in Middle East, especially when we lay hand, when we, this Muslim tried to argue with me, uh, with us, with our team about Trinity, about so many things. And then we asked him, is there anything we can pray for you? The, uh, just just yeah. this past week, somebody said, can you prove your God to me? Mm -hmm. Just think about the question. This is the most important question anybody, especially a Muslim, will ask you. Can you prove your God to me? How could you tell me that your God is a stronger than mine? I said, what, uh, what sickness, what problem do you have? Mm -hmm. And the guy was dealing with migraine. God, God, God is my witness. I sat him down in a, in, in a mall and then we laid hand on his head, prayed for him instantly he was healed he Incredible. Just, proved, just proved to him jesus is real mm -hmm. jesus is god that is so easy but sometimes as christians we take these things for granted and i we, know everybody else has it yes the, the offer just offer that's, prayer yeah that's what christians don't realize because if you're always being a christian you don't know what it's like to be without god Without, you don't know what it's like. Yeah. Without Jesus. It without is, Jesus, know. exactly. Yeah. It's incredibly, incredibly hard. There is nothing worse than taking Jesus out of your life. There is nothing, nothing worse than this. Nothing worse. Like I said, you I didn't take hear the light it. out. Yeah. Utter darkness will take yes. over. Exactly. When they come. Jesus said in uh, John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief talking about Satan only comes to, to steal, steal kill and destroy, kill and destroy. There yes. is, he, he has no other missions he's not going to give you powers and um no yeah. if it comes in all sorts of forms you name it yoga psychics mm -hmm. you name it islam mm -hmm. he doesn't mm -hmm. care what you need hinduism buddhism mm -hmm. he doesn't care yeah he comes to steal kill and steal. destroy yeah and jesus said i have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. More abundantly, yeah. It yeah, is only, life or yeah. it is death. And and the Bible says, I have put that in front of you. You Amen. Muslims that are watching and you think that you're funny to um, play with these things. The God, of, um, the God of heaven and earth, the God of creation has put this before you. Life and death. And mm -hmm. it's telling you to choose life. 
-hmm. And Jesus said, I am life. I am life. I am resurrection. And he has put him in front of you. He had, you you've heard it enough. We have proven to you so many testimonies and so many um, uh, stories of Muslim converting to Christianity. There is not such a thing in Islam that somebody converts to Islam and has encounter with God and God is going to take his pain or his sins away. When you convert to Islam or as you say, when you revert to Islam, you just fall from a, a hole to a well. You just, you just made it worse. You know it. You, the ones that they have converted and are watching, you know it. You just made your situation 10,000 times worse. You went from one thing to another thing. But if you want to come out of that darkness and depression, Jesus is the only way. Is only the way. only name. The Amen. only name that was given under heaven. It wasn't Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and this. No, there is one name that there is salvation in it. And that is Jesus Christ. For, uh, for the last, uh, Sister Wood, um, with the closing thoughts, uh, what do you have to say? All praise, all praise to the Holy One. Um, surrender your life to Jesus. You will not regret it. I know it's hard to tell you because I find it's like trying to tell someone who has never seen chocolate, who has never, I use that analogy, who has never tasted chocolate, what chocolate tastes like, what it looks like. But I promise you, surrender your life to Jesus. Yes. Call out to him. He says, knock and I will open. Call on me and I will answer and he will answer. You, you will not regret it. Never, he is ever. never, ever, never, ever. I play that song. There's a song that says, I have decided to, to follow Jesus and there's no turning back. And I play it on repeat still four or five years later. There's no turning back. I will never turn back. Absolutely. He is everything. He is everything. He is incredible. And I wish for every you listening to experience them, to find them, because he is all you need. You don't need anything else, anyone else. Religion will not save you. Religion is just that you. religion. You need Jesus. That's it. Religion will not satisfy you. No, will not satisfy you. That hole, that, yes, that empty and in our heart, that emptiness, that hole, um, only he can satisfy, only Jesus. Wow. Wow. He is the truth, the life, and the way. Wow. Praise Thank God. You. And that is the truth. Thank you, sister, for sharing your powerful testimony with the world. People are watching from all over the world. Make sure you write in the comments where you're watching from. I'm very interested. Uh, God is faithful. He's working everywhere. And... Um, it is powerful, powerful testimony. You should share it with everyone. Everyone should hear it, share it on your social media, share it. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you're subscribed. And um, if you all, um, also want to mention my book called Forsaking My Father's Religion, I believe, um, Sarah, you should write a book. You have a powerful <laughs> testimony and you should do it. This book is called Forsaking My Father's Religion. If you would like a free copy of it, go to our website, iranchristians.org. I've been like, meaning uh, to get that book. Actually, I've heard you talk about it before absolutely. and I want to read it. It's on my list to one of the books I want to read. <laughs> absolutely. You just write. Yeah. Uh, um, when you go to the website, there's a um, tab called free book. You just write us and we will be glad to, to send it to you free of charge. This is going to be a gift from our, our ministry to you. Thank, Thank you, 